So you will routinely find the gods acting in ways uh, that are lewd. You will find the gods acting in ways of drunkenness. You will find the gods acting in ways of deceitfulness. So many of the stories will be about how a god comes down to earth and does one of two things. He tricks somebody or he tries to find a way to sleep with somebody. That's what most of the gods did in most of those mythologies. They are prideful, they're arrogant, they're vain. These are the gods that surround those people in their everyday life. And so John is concerned with that idea or that statement, and this is the idol that he wants to confront, that our God is not like us. He's not like you, and he's not like me. And so what John wants them to understand is this idea instead. In verse 5, this is the message, and we declare it to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Here's the truth, John says. And that's what John is concerned with. What's the truth of who God is? Who is the true God? He says, here it is. He is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. Now, sometimes when we think about the idea of light, we say, well, you know, light is sort of a spectrum, right? At one end, we have all light, and at the other end, we have all darkness. And somewhere along the way, there's a mixture of the two. If we go outside right now, we're going to say, it's pretty light outside. If we wait just a couple of hours, though, it's going to be not quite as light outside, but we wouldn't say it's dark yet. If you wait another half an hour or so after that, you're going to say, now it's getting pretty dark. We'll even comment on, see the light way out there? Way out in the sunset, isn't that pretty? Isn't that beautiful? We'll take pictures of it, post on Facebook. Oh, Arizona sunset, so fantastic. We'll talk about it, but it's just a little bit of light and a lot of darkness. And if you get up in the middle of the night, you're going to say, yeah, it's really dark outside. And we sometimes think about light in that way. But John and the Bible itself does not talk about light in that way at all. In fact, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, the first sort of mention of light, it's very interesting how uh, it's recorded for us in Genesis, the first chapter, verses 1 through 5. It says this, it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. How is the earth and the, the, the void and the, 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 the waters described? What's the term? Darkness. Not mostly darkness. Not it's kind of dusky. It says it's dark. That's it. It's just dark. 100% darkness. Verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning for the first day. When God goes and he describes for us how creation occurred, look at what happens. He says, there was darkness. Then he didn't say it got a little brighter. He said, there was light. And then it said, I took those two things and I did what with them? I separated them. I pulled them apart from each other. Not I stretched it out in some sort of uh, band from here to there. He just took them and he pulled them apart. He said, light's over there, dark's over there. And then he took this new thing that he created, and he said, that's good. Not somewhere along here it's good, and somewhere along here it's bad, and you know, there's a little bit in between. He said, that's good, 100%. And then he named that and said, that's called light. That's how light is described in the scripture. And when you look at what John is saying, John is doing that same kind of idea here. There is no mixing of light and dark. He says, God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. No darkness at all. I'll do projects sometime because um, somewhere in my, in my right brain side, I guess, there people, you know me, and people say he's very logical, he's very left-brained, but I have this little itch in my right brain uh, that makes me make things, it makes me create. And I'll do projects, and, and sometimes when you paint those things, Here's what you do. You get a color like white, and you can look at it right on the tube, and it'll say, like, you know, titanium white or pure white. And you'll squirt that out of the little jar there, and you'll use that some. Or then you'll go, I don't want that white. I'm going to take this other color. I'm going to just drop a couple drops in there. Drop, drop, drop. And you mix it up. Is it white anymore? It's not. 
It's some other color now. It's got a little bit of darkness mixed in. And we sometimes think that that is how God exists and operates. And John says it's just not true. No darkness in God at all. What he goes on to say then in verse 6 again is, If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in the darkness, we're lying and we do not the truth. John says, we worship an idol God, we worship an idol when we claim to have fellowship with God, and yet we're walking in the darkness. When you do that, John says, you're worshiping a false God. You can't do those two things. Why is that the case, he says? Because we're not living out what is the truth. You know, the King James Version has it, we lie and we do not the truth. I think the New American Standard says we're not practicing the truth. Uh, the NIV actually says we're not living truth. There is a truth. What was it? Well, John just told us. He said, God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. When you say, oh yeah, I like that, and yet you walk over here in darkness, says you're not living what is true. You're living what is false. Our idol God, we think, has fellowship with darkness. When we think of God and we say, I have fellowship with him, we are in a relationship together, and yet we live our lives walking over here in darkness, that's a false concept. You don't have fellowship. Your idol God that's mixed some darkness in, he has fellowship with you, and you think, yeah, I'm good to go. John says, that's not the truth. The true God can have no fellowship with darkness because he is completely separate from it. There's no darkness in him at all. He can't be with you. He can't walk in fellowship with you. He can't accept your worship because that would put some darkness in him. And he can't do it because there's no darkness in that God at all, not in the true God. As he looks at that idea, then he says then in verse 7, But if we're walking in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all of our sin. John says that walking in the light is necessary if you want to have fellowship with the true God. Now the very easy question here is, why is that the case? Why is that the case? Why does that have to be that in order to have fellowship with God, I have to walk in the light? Well, John answered that for us two verses ago, didn't he? Because what is the light? God's the light. God is the light. That's what he said. So if God is the light, there's God, he's light, he's right there, and I want to walk in the light, then what am I really walking in? I'm walking in God. That's what I'm doing. If I want to have fellowship, I've got to walk in that light. Walking in light is walking in God. And he says, and when you do that, when you walk in God, in order for that to be true, what must occur? You must be purified from your sins. Because if you want to be with God, God can't have any mixture with darkness. And so it says when we walk with him and we're in the light, then we are purified from all of our sins. Verses 8 and 9. It says if we say that we do not have sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. As John's sort of thinking about this or laying this out, right, he says, if you're walking in him, if you walk in the light, he'll cleanse you of your sin. And the first thought that someone might say, he kind of does like Paul does sometimes, he anticipates the response. He anticipates the response that someone might give, which is if you told this to them, they might say, John, I I don't have any sin. I have no sin. He he can't purify me from that because I don't have any of that. He says, some may say that I have no sin. Now, where does that come from? Why would someone say that? I mean, that's an interesting question. Why would you say, I don't have any sin? You know, especially if, if the Apostle John is telling you, you know, if you, if you walk in Jesus, he'll purify of your sins. You say, I don't, I don't have any sins. There's only two things that I could think of. Maybe you'd come up with others, but I thought of these two. Someone might do that because this falseness can come from wanting to walk in the light. Right? I want to serve God. I want to be with God. I want to be in him. And so I say, well, in order to do that, I have to have no sin. I I think that I can't have any sin because if God is light, I can't have any sin at all. And so I don't have any. I'm good. We're, We're in fellowship. We're going along. Everything's great. 
The other idea that I think it could come from is this idea that we want to look good in front of other people. Could you imagine if the Apostle John said to you, if you want to be in God, you've got to walk in light, and if you walk in light, he's going to purify your sin, and you want to say to him so bad, I don't have any sin. John, I do so good, I don't have any sins. I'm, I'm, I'm a good guy. And we might say, well, that seems silly, but don't we do that too? I mean, we still do that with each other. Can you imagine if an apostle was standing right there? It'd be even worse, right? But we do that with each other. We say, I don't have any sins in my life. I'm good. Everything's great. I got it covered. I have things under control. John says about that idea, both which are motivated sort of by a good thing. I want to be pure. I want to be right. I want to be righteous. He says when we do that, when we say those things, that's not the truth. That's not the way that things really are. He says, if we really want to have no sin, if you want to be that position, which I think we all do, which is why we say those things, if you really want to have no sins, he says, you've got to confess your sins. You have to confess those things. You have to say that, no, I do have sin, God. I do have those things in my life. Here's the thing. We hide our sin from an idol God. We think there's this God who we have a false concept of, and we say, from him, what do I do with my sin? I hide it. I think I can hide my sin from God, just like Adam and Eve did, right? He said, we can hide from God, just like Jonah did. I can hide from God. People have been doing this forever. Why? Because they have a concept of God that's backwards, that's false, that's just not true. We try and hide our sins from an idol God, but the true God, The true God, he says, is faithful to forgive us. If we confess our sins, our God, the real God, will forgive us those things. You want to have no sins, he says, we confess them to our God. Verse 10. He says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Imagine John is telling this to you again. He says, look, If you walk in the light, God will cleanse you from your sins. And you say, I don't have any sin. I don't have any sin. And John says, look, that's not true. We've all sinned. I know you have sin. I know I have sinned, right? And God will forgive us of our sin. And the next thing it says, if we say that we have not sinned, that's interesting because it sounds like he's just repeating himself, doesn't it? It sounds a little bit like he's saying the same thing twice. But I think what may be happening instead is this. Uh, Sometimes we come to God, or when we first approach God, when we first come to know him, we might say, I have no sin to deal with. Think about if you've ever gone out and you've tried to talk to someone, you've tried to share the gospel with them. What's the first thing you have to convince them of after you convince them that there's a God? What's the first thing you've got to convince them of? You're lost. You have a problem. Right? Have you ever tried to convince somebody that they're lost? What's the first thing that they say? I'm not lost. I'm good. I'm a good person. I don't have a problem. Sin is not a problem for me. I don't do this. I don't do that. I don't murder. I don't whatever. I'm, I'm a good person. I'm not lost. Now, after you've convinced them that they're lost, and maybe you, you come around to converting them, and they come to Christ, and sometime later you go back and you approach them again, Right? And you say, you know, how are things going with you? How are things moving along? Right? You were saved. You've, uh, you've been cleansed of your sins. Uh, what's, your, what's your story now? Right? Sort of like we're in this position. And oftentimes we'll do what we do and we say, like, well, I haven't sinned since. Right? Since I've been saved, since I came to Christ, I haven't sinned anymore. I'm still in that same state that I was in before. That seems like what John is saying here. Some will say, I don't have any sin. And once he says, no, you have sinned, and God is faithful and just to forgive you of that, you say, okay, right, but I'm good since then. Since the last time I went to God and I confessed to him, God, I have sinned in my life, and I need you to cleanse me of that, we say, I'm covered. I haven't sinned again. If we say we have not sinned, what does John say about that? John says, claiming no sin makes God into what? A liar. Now, that's an interesting idea, isn't it? In reality, can you make God anything? Not really, right? I can't make God into something. I can't force my will upon him uh, like the potter on the clay, right? I'm the wrong end of that equation. I'm the clay. 
I can't make the potter into anything. And yet what John says here is he says, when we say we haven't sinned, how easy is that to do? It's pretty easy, right? I can say right now, I have not sinned. Super easy. And John says, when you say that, what you do is what? He says, you make God into a liar. Now, do you really make him into a liar? Can you really force God to be a liar by something that you say? You cannot. And yet, that's exactly what John says. What's the only thing he can mean by that? The only thing he can mean by that is we take God, we take the true and living God, and we do what with him? We substitute him for something else. We say, my God can lie. My God can be a liar. I'm going to take this true God, I'm going to substitute him into this God instead. I'm going to make him like the Roman gods and the Greek gods that are around me. Go read your mythology. They lie all the time. Why? are just like us. He says, when we say we have not sinned, we take God and we make him into a liar. Our idol God is a God that lies, like the pagan gods. John says about that what? He says, this is false. This is not true. This is not his word. His word is not in us. What word? What word is it that John is concerned with here? What was the word that he's talking about? Well, John's already told us. Remember the very beginning, verse 5? He said what? He says, I have a message. This is the message that we have heard from who? From him. What he's saying there in verse 5 is, I have a word from God. Here it is. And then he tells you what it is. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. John said, when we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Which is not the message, because the message is what? God is true. God is light. There's no darkness in him. If you make God into a liar, if your God can lie, he says, that's not the word we've heard from God. That's not the true God. That's an idol because there's no darkness in the true God. And what is John's concern for us? He says, little children, keep yourself away from that idol. Keep yourself away from it. That's not the God that we serve and worship. Let's go to God in prayer. Our God and our Father in heaven, we come to you and we thank you and praise you for uh, your greatness and for your word that you delivered to your apostles and that they gave it here to us and preserved for us Uh, In these scriptures, we're so grateful for the message that you gave to John to deliver to us that you are light and there is no darkness in you at all. Father, we're grateful for that, and we pray that you would help impress that on our minds and on our hearts, uh, not just on our lips. Because, Father, we can say that. We can say that we worship a God who is all light and in him is no darkness at all. And yet, to really live that way, to believe that deep inside, to understand that that's who you are and live it out and to practice it in our lives and then still say we have fellowship with you, uh, that's a harder thing, Father. And so we pray that you would impress this truth on our minds and our hearts as we meditate upon it uh, and draw closer to you. Father, we're so glad and grateful that because of who you are, that we can have that walk with you, that we can have that fellowship, not through our own merit, but because the blood of your son uh, cleanses us from our sin. Father, we're so grateful of that blessing uh, that's due to his sacrifice on our behalf. And so we are grateful that you have purified us and washed us so that we can have no sin as well so that we can also walk with you. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us to do that, that we would walk with you so we can be cleansed of our sin and have it removed from us so that there's no darkness in us either. Father, we pray and we are uh, glad of that sacrifice, and we ask you to help us to be mindful of it at all times. Help us to understand that even though that's the case, that we still do sin and that the solution for that, the way that we fix that thing is not to say that we have not, because that replaces you with some idol and false god that can lie. But instead, we understand, we, help, uh, we ask you to help us to confess our sins because we know 
that the true God, that you and your true form, that you are faithful and you are just to forgive us of our sins uh, when we confess them to you instead of trying to hide them from you. Father, we pray that you would help us to have soft and humble hearts because we know it's our pride uh, that prevents us from uh, speaking with you in that way, that uh, truly coming to you and confessing our, our sins to you and to one another uh, is because of our prideful hearts. And so we pray that you would soften them for us, Father, so we can be uh, truly in fellowship with you. Father, we're so grateful that you have preserved this message for us, and we're so grateful that we have this opportunity that we can come to you uh, and talk to you in this way because of the sacrifice of your son. And so it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen. We're going to sing this song that uh, John has selected for us. Uh, where